Carson City. I passed by. I passed by a lot of places in 1963 with my lifelong painter buddy, Phil Sagunik. We were 23 years old. I turned 24 on the road because I'm older than he is. And we came from New York to California on a couple of motor scooters. It took us about a month. We did that because we didn't know any better. <laughs> New York kids, it's a well-established fact that New York kids don't know anything about the rest of the country. <laughs> we didn't know how big the country was, we didn't know how high the Rockies were, we didn't know about deserts, and we certainly didn't know that we would be driving directly into the western, western wind most of the time. I want to call the book, which I wrote about the trip, how to freeze an instructional manual. <laughs> <laughs> then when the publishers turned it down. But I know that we came across a lot of desert and saw a lot of mountains in the distance and spent most of the time wondering where's the next gas station? <laughs> because in those days, motor scooters didn't have gas fuel gauges to do now. They only had little knobs you could turn to release sick, about enough gas for about 15 or 20 miles. That's all. And I never, I never crossed this desert or anything like it without remembering that feeling. What if we went out? How long would it take them to find us? <laughs> <laughs> I also remember the time very fondly because it's more than 50 years ago. And in the words of a great French songwriter, <coughs> we don't. No, I don't do it in English. We don't pass ces toujours belles. The time past is always beautiful. Once it's good and gone. <laughs> so I do remember it. And Phil and I still talk about it. And we talk about. We talk about the fact that the wrist music. We didn't wear helmets. We didn't have any kind of protective letters. And we had discovered a mar remarkable thing, that if you sneaked up really close in the wake of the truck, the vacuum behind would suck you along a lot faster than the And we never thought much about the fact that the truck had to stop. For any given reason, so we would probably have to be very sober and around at waffles. <laughs> but when my son, many years later, began driving two wheels because he won a little Honda 50 in laughter, I was very careful never to let him drive so much from his workshop in the barn up to the house without a helmet, without a protective gear. So I established good, good motor scooter and motorcycle habits. I mean, this was a very important thing. When he finally came to me and said, I read that book. <laughs> <laughs> the one about the motor schools. Uh huh. They blurted out, You guys came across country in your underwear. <laughs> <laughs> and I told him that he had now learned the most important thing any child can learn about his or her parents. They're all liars and hypocrites. <laughs> <laughs> And we'd gone all day. 
And I was alone in the cabin, and I needed to have something to show him when he got back from more painting cabins. <laughs> I needed to show him that I was working too. <laughs> Only I had one book published already, I'd written another one, which got turned down, and I really didn't know what I was going to be doing next. And I tried this line and that, I tried to make a couple of false starts. And then from somewhere, I got the line, the unicorn lives in the lilac wood, and she lives all alone. Uh-huh. Now what? <laughs> <laughs> and then I came up with another line, and very slowly another. So that I had at least a couple of pages done by the time Phil got back. And with more paint in this canvas, so we both pleased each of us could see that we were the other was working. Basically, we were showing off each other. <laughs> and we continued all that summer. Um, I drove, I got about 45 pages of my student book to the world. It's not a last student book you know, because I jumped it pretty much after that summer. And I didn't know where it was going, or what the story was about. And besides, I was marrying a woman with three children. And I had to learn how to feed people, which was not something I had ever had to learn. <laughs> so in a way, I was glad of an excuse to drop the last uniform and start writing book reviews and interviews and magazine pieces, anything that would bring me money. Because I didn't know where the story was going. I didn't want to think about it very much. And I probably wouldn't have had my wife and children, especially my wife, hadn't pushed me into starting it over again. Because she liked it. She wanted to know how it came out. So very slowly I began buying time from the road trips to stay home and went to the war on the last unit. And I read, would have read it. I read it to my family as we were going along. Because I was too scared to show it to anybody else. <laughs> And if they hadn't liked it, that would have been I would have put it second time. So it started in 1962. It finally got finished in 1968. Published. And I was so glad to have that over with, I can't tell <laughs> I tell people, and it's absolutely true, there is nothing on that table out there that wasn't more fun to write than the last one. <laughs> Still right here, Peter? Yes. I first, uh, well, first, thank you for doing this. Yeah. I first came upon your name in the, um, in the Valentine edition of The World of Rings. Uh, I wrote a book before because my editor, Del Ray Books, Judy Lynn Del Rey, in my book, called me, was living in Coralitos, California, and she called from New York. So we're putting out a new edition of The Last Unicorn, and we need a foreword, and I'll be in the office for an hour and a half. Oh, okay, all right, all right, Judy Lynn. All right. That was more or less the nature of the relationship. So I stumped around in my office, mumbling to myself, and finally came up with a thing that's in the new edition. Well, it really is an old edition now, but that preface is still there. And I read it to her over the phone. And she said, that was, a, that was, as I say, the basis of the relationship. There's a story that goes with it, because when the book came out, that new edition, I was in Los Angeles, waiting for a bus, and I saw a young woman sitting on the bench waiting herself and reading that edition. It was irresistible. I sidled over to her, I'm not good at costing to you. <laughs> I sidled over and asked, no, I got a forward in that book. She gave me a look. I began to turn to her. And what I didn't know is that when that first printing came out, about half of them had the forward, and the other half did <laughs> I leave you to imagine which edition she is. And I sidled away as fast as I sidled away. Folks, if you have questions, we will. <laughs> Listen, I will ask embarrassing questions too. So she had her hand up way in the back. Um, how did you know you wanted to be a writer? How did you know you wanted to be a writer? I can't remember not wanting to be a writer. I know that I started writing before I could read, before I could write. I would make up a story and get my mother to write it down. I don't know whether I fell in love with story first 
all the words. It was pretty close. You know, I dearly loved being read to. And my father remembered at a dinner party at the house, me wandering around with a book in my hands, asking, I remember his friend, Joe Silverman, Mr. Silverman, can you read? <laughs> because it was still magic to me that anybody could. And on the other hand, my mother remembered me coming up to her at the stove and asking her the, the meaning of two words I didn't know, gentle and regular. <laughs> and she told me what they were, and I went away saying to myself, to get used to them. I think now it was entirely likely that I may have been listening to a laxative commercial. <laughs> Vision for the live action movie? On the one hand, I think it's going to happen. I do. And on the other hand, there are so many actors I don't know today that I don't even think about cast. That's the thing you do when you're more younger, sort of an age, of an age with your actors. I don't think about it. I do like to remember Christopher Lee, who's 90 now, yes. I do like to remember. Christopher saying privately, it may come there may come a time when you do get to make the last unicorn in a live version. <laughs> and it is possible that at that time I may have passed on. <laughs> do not let it concern you. <laughs> I have risen from the dead several times. <laughs> I don't know how it's done. I believe <laughs> Here, Peter. Were there any particular locations in the real world that inspired some of the scenery in the novel of The Last Unicorn? Well, I can tell you that the sequence from the unicorns in the climax, when the unicorns come out of the sea, that was the last thing I wrote in the book. I skipped it. I couldn't visualize what I was trying to write about. And I skipped it and went on to the end of the book and then came back. And in about a week and a half or two weeks, wrote that two-paragraph scene. But what helped was that I was living in Santa Cruz, California at the time. And I would go down, and was quite close to the ocean's side, and go down and sit and watch the surf break. And try to imagine, try to visualize the unicorns actually emerging from those waves. And it took me longer than you might think before I finally saw it and went back to the house and began to write slowly that scene. And there are other places in there. Um, I was living in rural country at the time. So there are images and flashes of places where I was living, where friends of mine were living, or simply places I passed through. Nothing goes to waste. The, uh, the clock comes from his in-laws' living room in Albuquerque. <laughs> <laughs> Stashed my wife and children with her parents in 1967. And gone up to Taos to research an article on D.H. Lawrence's time there 45 years before. And we stayed with them for a few days. It was Christmas. We stayed for a few days before we went back to California. And they had an immense grandfather clock, which caught my attention. I just stared and stared and stared at it until I seemed to be somehow drawn away or hypnotized, drawn away beyond those swing pendulums there too, beyond the chimes, beyond something I hadn't yet imagined. I made up that riddle when the wine, drink, when the wine drinks itself, when the skull speaks, when the clock strikes the right time. I didn't know what any of that meant. <laughs> <laughs> this is the clock, maybe. And I began thinking about that. By the way, the, the, there's only a cat in the book because a family favorite described in the book as a little rag of a cat with a little copper and ashes cat with a crooked ear. But it happened to be asleep in my desk at the time I was writing that chat. <laughs> Right <laughs> 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 Um, for the music 
in the movie, did you approach America to do the soundtrack, and were they open to it at first? I had absolutely nothing to do with that. I didn't know that Jimmy Webb was going to be doing the movie, which was fine with me, because usually Frank and Bass would get create the songs themselves. Jules Bass would write the lyrics, and their their music director, Maureen Laws, would write the music. So I was very pleased to know that Jimmy Webb would be doing a real composer. Well, I'm just as glad that I didn't know that America is going to be singing the score. Not because they aren't wonderful, they are, they're perfect, I couldn't have chosen better. But because I hated the whole of no name. question that when <laughs> in literature class when your book is assigned the a lot of the discussion is focused on how your book is allegory for growing up and losing innocence uh -huh. uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. so I mean first question is how do you feel about that <laughs> and you know was that on your mind when you wrote it or did you just write a story that was really entertaining? I'm a storyteller. That's what I do. I learned that from my father. I, I don't do allegories. I don't do parables. And as Mr. Cochran up there can testify. May I, may I tell that one? Okay. I'm so glad no one videoed this. We were in New York City in a theater, and someone quite honestly showed up the Q&A session and said, Mr. Beagle, what's the moral of the last unicorn? And Peter, without a heartbeat's pause, said, oh, I don't have any morals. chosen that name 
long to his weight, is someone who turns out to be a, a goddess, ancient goddess. And then I had to give up and say, Jane, I used that name. When I was in high school, I had a terrific crush on a Greek girl. His name was Athanasia, Athanasia for sure. And that was the only Greek name that came into my head. <laughs> <laughs> that's truer than most writers than you might imagine. <laughs> Who doesn't have a raffle ticket? Put your hands in the air if you don't have a raffle ticket. If you just can't. Let me get if you just can't. Hands in the air if you don't have a raffle ticket. Okay, I'm in.